Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video, we'll be learning about the bones of the vertebral column. Now before I start with the explanation of the vertebrae with the specimens, please note that these holes right here in the middle of the body of the vertebrae is not a part of a true vertebrae. Since these are artificial bones, they are seen here. In this video, I will be explaining you how to differentiate between a cervical, thoracic and lumbar vertebrae and also between the individual vertebrates. To begin with, let's learn about the vertebral column as a whole. The vertebral column is also called the spine, the spinal column or the backbone. It is the central axis of the body. It supports the body weight and transmits it to the ground through the lower limbs. In this picture, we have the anterior view, the lateral view and the posterior view of the vertebral column. The vertebral column is composed of 33 vertebrae, the 7 cervical, the 12 thoracic, the 5 lumbar vertebrae, the 5 sacral and 4 coccygeal vertebrae. Sometimes the vertebrae are also grouped according to their mobility. The movable or the true vertebrae include the 7 cervical, the 12 thoracic and the 5 lumbar vertebrae which together make a total of 24. The thoracic vertebrae have ribs attached to them. The fixed vertebrae include those of the sacrum and the coccyx. The length of the spine is about 70 cm in males and about 60 cm in females. The intervertebral discs contribute one-fifth of the length of the vertebral column. Now let's concise the points that we learned about the vertebral column as a whole. Firstly, it is also called the spine, the spinal column or the backbone. It is the central axis of the body. It supports the body weight and transmits it to the ground through the lower limb. The vertebral column is made up of 33 vertebrae, the 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 4 coccygeal. In the thoracic, lumbar and sacral regions, the number of vertebrae corresponds to the number of spinal nerves. Sometimes the vertebrae are also grouped according to their mobility. The movable or true vertebrae include the 7 cervical, 12 thoracic and 5 lumbar, making a total of 24. The 12 thoracic vertebrae have ribs attached to them. Finally, the fixed vertebrae include those of the sacrum and coccyx. Let's look at the parts of a typical vertebrae. Now I'm going to take the third thoracic vertebrae. A typical vertebra is made up of the following parts. Firstly, it has a body which lies anteriorly. It is shaped like a short cylinder being rounded from side to side. It has flat upper and lower surfaces that are attached to those of the adjoining vertebrae by intervertebral discs. Firstly, there is a body. It lies anteriorly. Its shape is like a short cylinder. It is rounded from side to side and it has flat upper and lower surfaces. Next, we have the pedicles. The right and the left pedicle. They are short rounded bars as you can see that projects backwards and somewhat laterally from the posterior part of the body, right here and right here. These are the pedicles. There are right and left pedicles. They are short, rounded bars projecting backwards and laterally. Nextly, we have the lamina. The pedicles is continuous postromedially, that is posteriorly and towards the midline of the body with a vertical plate of bone called the lamina. As you can see right here. This is the lamina. The pedicles and the lamina together form the neural arch. Pedicles are continuous posteromedially with a vertical plate of bone called the lamina. The pedicle and lamina together form the neural arch. The vertebral foramen that you see right here is bounded anteriorly by the posterior aspect of the body, on the sides by the pedicle and posteriorly by the lamina. It is bounded anteriorly by the posterior aspect of the body, 
sides by the pedicle and behind by the lamina. Each vertebral foramen forms a short segment of the vertebral canal that runs through the whole length of the vertebral column and lodges the spinal cord. Passing backwards and downwards from the junction of the two laminae right here, we have the spinous process. Passing backwards and downwards from the junction of the two laminae, there is a spinous process. Passing laterally and downwards from the junction of each pedicle and lamina, we have the transverse process. Passing laterally and downwards from the junction of each pedicle and corresponding lamina, there is a transverse process. The spinous and the transverse processes that you see right here serve as levers for muscles acting on the vertebral column. From a morphological point of view, the transverse processes are made up of two elements, the transverse element and the costal element. In the thoracic region, the two elements remain separate and the costal elements forms the rib. Projecting upwards from the junction of the pedicle and the lamina, we have an articular process that is a superior articular process on each side as you can see right here. Projecting downwards, similarly we have inferior articular process. Projecting upwards from the junction of the pedicle and lamina, there is on either side a superior articular process. Similarly projecting downwards, there is an inferior articular process. There is a large inferior vertebral notch below the pedicle and a shallow superior vertebral notch above the pedicle. The superior and inferior vertebral notch of corresponding vertebrae form the intervertebral foramen. Finally, we have the intervertebral foramen. A shallow superior vertebral notch above the pedicle and a large inferior vertebral notch below the pedicle join to form the intervertebral foramen. Let's see how to differentiate between a cervical, thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. A typical cervical vertebrae has a presence of transverse foramen in the transverse process as you see right here. A thoracic vertebrae has a presence of coastal facets on either side of the body of the vertebrae for the articulation with the ribs. While the lumbar vertebrae has a large body in comparison to the cervical and thoracic vertebrae as well as it has absence of coastal facets and the transverse foramen. Beginning with the cervical vertebrates, we have seven cervical vertebrae. The first that is the atlas, the second the axis, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and the seventh. The first, second and seventh cervical vertebrae are atypical vertebrae whereas the third, fourth, fifth and sixth are typical cervical vertebrates. Now how do we identify a typical cervical vertebrae? Well, it is by identifying the presence of a transverse foramen right here. This is the transverse foramen. This is the C5. And it is a typical cervical vertebrae. Along with that, we can also notice that there is a bifid spinous process in the typical cervical vertebrae. Well, so how do we identify the atypical cervical vertebrae? This is the first cervical vertebrae, that is the atlas. It is ring shaped and it has no body and no spinous process. That is the identification. This is the second cervical vertebrae and it is identified by the presence of an odontoid process or dense as you can see right here. The seventh cervical vertebrae has a long spinous process and it is not bifid. Now you can see the difference between a typical cervical vertebrae and the seventh cervical vertebrae. Firstly, there are seven cervical vertebrae. The first, second and the seventh are atypical vertebrae while the third to sixth are typical vertebrae. The typical vertebrae is identified by the presence of the transverse foramen while the atypical, the first one, 
is the atlas which is ring shaped which has no body and no spine. The second is the axis which is identified by the dense or the odontoid which is a tooth like process. The seventh cervical vertebrae is a, has a long spinous process. It is not bifid. Moving on to the thoracic vertebrae, we have 12 thoracic vertebrae. The first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth thoracic vertebrae. The first, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth thoracic vertebrae are atypical vertebrae, whereas the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth are typical thoracic vertebrae. Now, how do we identify a typical thoracic vertebrae? Well, it is by the presence of coastal facets that you can see right here on the sides of the bodies. These are the coastal facets. Now what about the identification of the atypical ones? The first thoracic vertebrae has a body that resembles that of a cervical vertebrae. The spine is long, thick and horizontal. The superior coastal facet is complete. The ninth thoracic vertebrae has a body that has only a superior coastal facet. The tenth thoracic vertebrae has a single complete superior coastal facet. The eleventh thoracic vertebrae has a single large coastal facet and the transverse process is small. Lastly, the twelfth thoracic vertebrae has a shape similar to the lumbar vertebrae. Now moving on to the thoracic, there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. The 1st, 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th are atypical vertebrae. The 2nd to 8th are typical vertebrae. The typical vertebrae are identified by coastal facets on the sides of the vertebral bodies. The atypical vertebrae which includes the 1st, 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th. The 1st has a body that resembles the cervical vertebrae. Its spine is thick, long and horizontal. The superior coastal facet is complete. Now the ninth thoracic vertebrae has a body which has only one superior coastal facet. The tenth thoracic vertebrae has a single complete superior coastal facet. The eleventh thoracic vertebrae has a single large coastal facet and the transverse process is small. The twelfth thoracic vertebrae has a shape which is similar to the lumbar vertebrae. Finally, moving on to the lumbar vertebrae, we have five lumbar vertebrae. The first, second, third, fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae. The fifth lumbar vertebrae is atypical whereas the first, second, third and fourth are the typical lumbar vertebrae. Now how do we identify a typical lumbar vertebrae? Well, firstly, the body is large as you can see here and kidney shaped. The vertebral foramen is triangular in shape. The spinous process forms a quadrilateral plate like structure and the transverse process is thin and tapering. Finally to identify the fifth atypical lumbar vertebrae, the transverse process is thick short and pyramidal in shape as you can see right here it is thick short and pyramidal the body is largest of all the lumbar vertebrae now moving on to the lumbar vertebrae we have five lumbar vertebrae the fifth one is the atypical one while the first to fourth are typical ones the typical one is identified that the body is large and kidney shaped the vertebral foramen is triangular the spine forms a vertical quadrilateral plate. The transverse process is thin and tapering. Now the atypical fifth lumbar vertebrae. The transverse process are thick, short and pyramidal in shape while the body is largest of all lumbar vertebrae. I hope you found this video helpful. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.